let's get to the next one. We uh, uh, we're going to talk about everyone's favorite uh, uh, topic, ESG. Hopefully, we can go through E, S, and the G part of it. Uh, joining on the stage is uh, my uh, colleague Elisa Gucci, um, and uh, I'm going to get the names properly. Uh, Daniel Wong from uh, F2 Pool, uh, Harry Sudok from Grid, and Fred Thiel, uh, uh, CEO of Marathon. This is really bright. Is everyone yeah. else feeling how bright this is? No? OK. <laughs> I can't see uh, so thank you, Elian, for a wonderful introduction. I think you pretty much said everything there is to be said. So thank you, everyone, for being here today. And I would like to start with just a quick round of questions, because this is a very heated topic, and we can maybe set some facts. So if you can keep this in. Um, well, opinions maybe, yes or no. I would really appreciate it. So, do we think that climate change is real? Yes. 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 <laughs> that, that took you a while, Harry. Um, do we think that we, do we think it is an option at all to reduce the energy consumption of Bitcoin mining? No. That was a quick one. It's hard to do a yes or no without explanation. Okay, go for it. Okay, so I think every day we're reducing the energy, we're increasing the energy efficiency of Bitcoin mm -hmm. mining. The latest generation Bitmain S19 XPs are 30% more efficient than the mm -hmm. prior generation S19, which is four times more efficient than the S9, et cetera. So we are getting it better and better at it. And um, I think as more and more Bitcoin mining gets sited behind the meter, at power generation, uh, you get more and more energy efficient. So yes. Yeah, I, I think he answered it pretty well. But the overall trend is that the energy consumption is going up. But this, this is, but that's the that's the wrong framing, right? Like not every unit of energy is created equal, and the value that Bitcoin mining is able to deliver to this economic center of mass that is Bitcoin is enormously valuable and useful. And so you know, it's like it's like saying you know I I don't want to. You know, eat, eat clean and feed my body. I just need to do less. We just need to do less. Like, it, it's nonsense, right? If we want to live within the context of an emerging industry that's delivering enormous good to individuals all over the planet, the security model of that system needs to grow over time as the utility and the usage grows over time. And the type of power that's made available to miners that we're engaging with is also incredibly positive sum. Mm -hmm. So we think that the energy consumption is integral to the security of the network, and therefore it's not necessarily desirable for it to be reduced. Yes, okay. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great. So my next question is, would we agree that um, a climate positive direction for the industry and for the world in general is to use less fossil fuels? Yes. Yes. OK, great. So I think we have all that sorted out. So. Uh, one thing that's been discussed uh, lately quite a lot is whether mining can actually be a resource to grids, whether mining can help the world transition to um, a cleaner energy mix. And I want to ask Harry, who works on this quite a lot, to give us run through the argument of how this could work. Yeah, I think the, the, the important piece to understand around this is really around how do energy grids function. And so how do we understand the Bitcoin mine within the context of the broader system that it exists within? So in any basic energy system, you've got generation, transmission, and delivery. Those are the, the three players within an energy grid. And you know, generation is the turbine or the solar panel or the, or the, you know, the nuclear plant. The transmission are the high voltage lines that can move power up to 500 miles. And then delivery is the spider web of substations and, and lower voltage delivery lines that bring power to your house or into your ASIC potentially. So, you know, that's the that's the grid environment overall. And you know, historically, um, until the the invention of proof of work at scale, 
um, the ability for an energy consumer to be interruptible uh, was very limited. Um, you know, so if you look at a big, you know, let's just think of a big energy customer of times of times historically, an auto manufacturer, an aluminum smelter, heavy industry. Um, those customers do not have an ability to curtail their energy consumption in a dynamic fashion because the energy bill represents a huge, you know, a much smaller percentage. Um, of their cost of goods sold than it does for a miner. So for a miner, the more efficient we are, the higher a percentage of our monthly expenses our power bill is. For an auto manufacturer, you've got a huge amount of labor, you've got a huge amount of parts and inventory and all the different components that go into the assembly line, and the power might make up 25 or 30% of, of that income statement. So the Bitcoin mining um, grid participant is a fundamental innovation in what kind of customer is available to an energy market. And so the ability to introduce interruptibility in that dynamic fashion has never been seen before. And so the opportunities for us to structure new kinds of power purchase agreements, new types of behind uh, the meter, in front of the meter, types of relationships with power providers uh, unlocks a new level of resiliency, a new level of environmental sustainability, and a new level uh, of, of price stability for other customers within these broader systems, all of which end up delivering value to the systems that we operate within. I, I think even when we were doing like our mock, right, we were talking specifically in Texas, right, what you're saying, energy smoothing or like energy price smoothing. And it's just like energy load balancing during times of like, it's very hot, everyone has their AC on, but when everyone doesn't have their AC on, like Bitcoin miners and farms can kind of be that like buyer of last resort. And so at the end of the day, with what you're saying, right, the, cust the people who are buying this electricity who are not even in the Bitcoin mining industry are, are benefiting. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, it acts as a big yeah. capacitor essentially, right? So it's, you can't shut down a, car assembly plant, you can't shut down a food processor, you can't shut down any process industry midstream because equipment seizes up, you have to clean it out, etc. Bitcoin miners can be shut down in under 30 minutes and can be brought back up in roughly the same time. Energy in this country um, really is used peak 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. And so the grid and power generators have to generate enough electricity to support that peak, but the rest of the day, those resources sit considerably idle. And especially when it comes to renewable energy, nuclear energy is the base load um, for the grid. Then comes coal, because those two energy sources you can't regulate up and down during the course of a day. Then you have these peaker plants or shaver plants, as they're called, which are natural gas-fired plants that then provide the next buffer. And last of all is solar and wind. And so what happens is, other than the 4 to 9 p.m. period of time, very little solar and wind actually is used by the grid, and so it sits idle. We deploy our miners behind the meter at renewable energy facilities so that we can use that energy when it's not going to the grid. And if and when the grid needs it, we can curtail 30 minutes. And then when the grid's done with the energy and we can use it again, we can provide it. There is no other incentive for a renewable energy provider providing wind or solar to keep investing and in growing their capacity if they can only sell 25 or 30 percent of the electricity they generate. And so by having a large Bitcoin miner behind the meter as that baseload customer, they now can operate profitably. Mm -hmm. In this country, we generate 14% more energy than we use. And if you put Bitcoin mining in <coughs> context, it's less energy globally than what we use to power holiday lights mm -hmm. in this country, which is a purely voluntary thing, by the way. Um, and when you look at the amount of capacity we can add as a buffer to the grid, we can essentially help accelerate the transition to more renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add, add to what you were saying with if there is energy waste. So for example, when the China ban came down and a lot of miners, mining farms are looking for new places to kind of settle, <clears throat> there are these like really great renewable energy sources that, that, that could be used. And so for example, what we were doing to help some of our mining farm clients was, right, there's a lot of these mining farms were comfortable and with using like some of the hydro in China, which is quite seasonal. But then, right, the, the world's second largest hydroelectric power plant is in Paraguay, and they have consistent energy and, and very cheap per kilowatt hour. And, and what was interesting with what we were seeing is that, right, 
Paraguay has a relationship with Brazil where kind of like Itaipu Dam, they sell half their energy to Brazil. And the half that Paraguay was using, they were only using about like 50% of that energy and the rest was not being used. Part of it is due to some of the infrastructure that some of these substations weren't, weren't built out. But yeah, like they finally passed like this mining license. There's no gray area and there's, no, there's an opportunity for both infrastructure to be developed have jobs be created, and then you are making use of like this, this electricity, this this mm. cleaner electricity than w what you would have, and and it's like, yeah, Paraguay is benefiting. A lot of the people in those regions are benefiting in those relationships. So, um, so could you give me an example, a, a specific example of where we've seen a miner go in and work with a renewable energy producer or clean nuclear energy producer? Um, buying the power, and then we have seen the energy producer invest actually in developing more. I think we're in the process of doing it. I mean, we're we are in West Texas. It's we're taking 280 megawatts of a 750 megawatt site that is 20 years old, and because of grid congestion, it's very difficult for them to sell a lot of power into the grid. And so, by us being a base load customer, they're now operating at a profitable cash flow in this model. And so they can now start to expand and do things like adding solar to their wind, because wind in West Texas is primarily afternoons and nighttime. Mm -hmm. If they add solar, they can now generate electricity over a bigger portion of the day. And they can just add more data center capacity to consume that electricity. So, you know, as I think somebody said on a panel earlier this morning, you know, energy buyers, Bitcoin miners go where there's excess energy. And uh, you're seeing, for example, in Kenya today, 17 gigawatts of geothermal power, and they don't have a customer for it. And they've built it, and now they're looking for customers. What we're going to see is the flip-flop, where Bitcoin miners are going to energy sources and saying, we'll help generate a financial uh, base case for you to get financing. I'll give you an example. Um, there's a um, cruise ship port that is um, being contemplated in Alaska. The cruise ship lines want renewable energy. They don't want to use diesel generators. This is on an island which has no consumers for electricity. So it's eight hours a day for four months of the year. Nobody can build a power plant that can operate profitably for eight hours a day, four months of the year only. And so it was suggested to them, look at adding Bitcoin mining. Because if you set up a hydro facility, you have this energy 24 seven that you can generate. You can sell it for eight months of the year, 24 hours a day. In the other four months, you can sell it 16 hours a day uh, for Bitcoin mining. That'll fund your project, get it underwritten, so that the cruise lines can benefit from renewable energy when they have it. Um, and that's a perfect example. You know, in the Middle East, for example, you have in, in, um, energy generation asymmetry during the seasons. In the summertime in Dubai, they generate, I think it's about four gigawatts of power and use it for air conditioning. Well, the rest of the year, they only need one gigawatt. So what do they do with that excess energy? Well, you either have to charge the consumer to keep all that infrastructure going, or you find another customer to keep that infrastructure going. And I think that's what you're just starting to see now, this transition start happening. Mm -hmm. and, and, but let's be clear about, about where, this, where this goes, that revenue doesn't just like happen and disappear, right? The revenue gets generated by a utility, and what does it do with that money? It doesn't. It doesn't just. It doesn't just go park it and, and buy Bitcoin and hold Bitcoin. It uh, it reinvests in the systems that are there. So things like safety, things like reliability, things like higher uptime, things like lower cost. All of those come out of a more profitable and prosperous utility environment. So when you think about you know the you know the the, e, the ESG mandate, the S and the G get massively benefited by those revenues as well. The E does in addition, but. But this is this is really a, a multi-layered value proposition for these um, for these energy systems because you know we we uh, as an industry haven't done a good enough job yet of making the case why more energy is critically important for human prospering, where more hospitals, more schools, more food availability, more you know high quality jobs, all of those are built on the back of low cost, high reliability energy. And so the more of that that we're able to bring into communities, the more the economic opportunities that will, will you know, grow in front of that. And Bitcoin mining has a direct impact on that being an available future. Mm -hmm. And a, lot, a specific example, you wanted a specific example, right? So like there's other dams um, in, in Paraguay like Vacaray. And so IDB had put out a report saying 
they needed to um, upgrade it. There was a lot of money that needed to be put into that. And so after like, right, one of the congressmen in Paraguay, Carlos Rahala, had passed this like Bitcoin mining license uh, uh, to, so that there wouldn't be no gray area, they started coming in and, and then having those, um, those talks too, right? If you if you let them build the substations into the into the other areas of Paraguay that do connect to like this, the 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 crumbling like hydroelectric power plants, then right it's like green lights for them. Mm -hmm. So I think right some of the smaller dams can definitely benefit from from that, and it's it's better than nothing because they don't have the money for that. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about accounting. So we have very, very, a very wide uh, range of estimates of how much clean energy is going into Bitcoin mining, um, ranging from anywhere to 20 to 60, 70 percent. Why is that? And why haven't we seen the industry follow government norms issued by international and national What authorities? What government norms are you referencing? I mean... So do you think they don't exist? No, I want to understand which one. Bitcoin mining as an industry is overwhelmingly more renewable than, than the vast majority of heavy industry and other high energy intense, intensive processes. So I think on a relative basis, we're already in an incredible position to build upon. Mm -hmm. It's an easy industry to, if you look at how the Bitcoin Mining Council does it, it's basically based on your electrical consumption. Right. So, and what's the source of the energy? So, how many megawatts are you consuming? What percentage of that is from, you know, nuclear, coal, uh, hydro, solar, et cetera? Um, and that's how they generate their number. But this is all self-reporting. Yes, it's all self-reported. But a lot of the companies self-reporting are public companies, and the data is being published. So, um, and to a certain extent, it's easy to audit. Right. I mean, as a public company. Our electric bills get totally reviewed by our auditors, yes. and they look at every little detail of it. So I don't think there's a lack of accounting in that perspective. The, the SEC is going to require publicly traded Bitcoin miners to report on their energy mix as part of their ESG. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you're going to start seeing the, this becoming more and more clear. But at the end of the day, compared to a process industry, where scope three, scope two emissions are much bigger pieces of it, and you're looking at shipping stuff from all over the world and freight and all these components. The Bitcoin mining industry is very straightforward. It's look at the electric bill, look at where that energy comes from. If it's grid energy, what's the grid mix? If it's behind the meter, what's that particular power plant? I mean, you it's very could easy also to audit. be looking at like the rest of the infrastructure that goes it, into into building a mine. I, I don't disagree, but it, that's a so small as a percentage of the overall. If you're trying to look at the carbon footprint, mm -hmm. right? So we're talking energy mix here. That's one thing. If you look at the carbon footprint, you know, there are less than um, 4 million minor rigs in the world today, right? How many cell phones are sold annually? It's billions, right? And so if you look at the e-waste uh, as a percentage, then it's very small. If you look at the carbon required to manufacture a miner, it's very small. It's 90% of the energy, of the footprint, if you would, is an energy footprint, and that's easy to audit. Do, so do you report to the SEC your energy mix in, a, in an auditable way? Not yet. Well, um, financially, in, with uh, we don't report the sources yet, but that's likely to happen mm -hmm. uh, as the reporting happens. Because that, that's something that Senator Gillibrand brought up yesterday mm -hmm. when she was talking about the, the bill that they have introduced in the Senate. And she said that when they, they, they wanted to include some kind of reporting standards for miners and perhaps the ecosystem more broadly, but they couldn't figure out how to... How to well, it, it's every miner pays an electric bill. Mm -hmm. Now, the percentage of miners that generate their own electricity is fairly small. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty simple thing to just have to submit your electric bills and then a, you know, to report on the content of the electricity you're purchasing. It's not a difficult thing for a miner to have to do. Mm -hmm. Harry, do you want to talk a little bit about Rex and, and how that works? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that the way that... Um, the way that carbon accounting is done, um, certainly in the U.S. today, is really a function of 
of the carbon equivalents of the generation being minted at the time of the generation. So if I, if I generate one megawatt hour of coal, I have one amount, you know, I, there's a carbon accounting methodology for that. If I generate one megawatt hour of wind, I receive what's called a renewable energy credit or a REC. Um, and what you do with that REC is really where sort of the, the burden of the carbon is placed. Um, and so, you know, may, one option is, you know, if you, if you are a solar or a wind operator, and this is really what they do, is they generate, you know, there's really two products that get generated with each megawatt hour. There's the megawatt hour of physical electricity that gets delivered, and there's the renewable energy credit that gets generated as part of that megawatt hour as well. And so there's an enormous liquid market for renewable energy credits for those looking to offset their, um, their footprint can voluntarily opt into to one of those markets. Um, maybe if they're working with, a, with a, a generator, you know, they can have those renewable energy credits never hit a liquid market in order to, to make an attestation that they are carbon um, neutral. You know, but but this, is, um, this is kind of a fraught process at this stage where you know, there's, a, there's a wide range of different types of recs that carry different sort of qualities to them. Um, there's a lack of standardization and transparency and clarity around this. I think that you know, the, the approach you know, that I've thought a lot about is really you know, how do you just do this on a, on a generation type go forward basis rather than trying to engage in like the accounting game of it all. So what does that mean? Call up my local hydro dam and try to sign a deal. Call up my local nuke and try to sign a deal. Engage, engage with um, high uptime, low environmental impact energy sources first and foremost, and try to kind of cut the the accounting game off before it even starts. So, you know, when you when you think about the different methodologies that are out there, you know, and this is my my challenge to to you know, to, to everybody who's engaged with this conversation in any way, shape, or form. If you think that environmentalists and anti-nuclear advocates are on the same side, you're wrong. There is no way forward from a high uptime, base load, cost-effective energy footprint without engaging in nuclear generation directly. Mm -hmm. uh, Elisa, I, I just want to also add and, and compliment what, what Harry was saying is that yes, maybe not all of the entire industry will switch to like these renewable energy sources, but I think there's also a really good opportunity for us to also do more. So right, you're talking about RECs, there's also like carbon credits and we've seen a lot of like these carbon credits come on chain and get tokenized and give a lot of these carbon projects and these originators an opportunity to have a lot more money that they can put and then invest into planting more trees or supporting some of these other natural like energy sources. But like when, when we were talking, I think um, earlier earlier this week, is that there's there's this right incentivization for this type of good behavior that, that can happen. So maybe like when I was like mining back in right like 2013, 14, like I was doing it for ideological reasons. But now it's right when you get to scale, it's right, it's profit maximization. But it's not like maybe you can maximize your profits and you can also care about these ideologies of like decentralization, self-sovereignty, immutability, et cetera. But, right, built into the consensus me mechanism of even Bitcoin, right, they follow the system because the, the tokens of Bitcoin that is generated is valuable to someone else. And so they don't even need to care about this sort of, the ideology, right? If they can make the money and then that works, that, that's, that's the system. So in the case where you can have this, you can define good behavior as, let's say, carbon offsetting or switching to renewables, then you can also need to incentivize that. And we've been seeing a lot of that, right, these complementary chains, let's say, that, that support Bitcoin. We have wrapped Bitcoin, like floating around Ethereum and other chains. Then, right, if you can find a way to have, like, carbon offsets be attached to Bitcoin, right, you can, these Bitcoins now can be green. And, and in some of these conversations that we've had, there's like sovereign wealth funds out there that have like ESG criteria goals that they want to satisfy. They do also want to participate in like hedging their bets on these, this sort of like new financial system in Bitcoin. And they're like, oh, we can't like have this Bitcoin because everyone's going to like hate us because, oh, Bitcoin is dirty. Offset it, go carbon negative where you offset more than you have. You have like Bitcoin that's been green. Maybe you can attribute it to a mining farm somewhere in Norway that has clean energy, 
right? Maybe not all the Bitcoin in the world will be, will be green like that. You can offset it with car tokenized carbon credits. Mm -hmm. And then you can have this sort of like flywheel of incentivized good behavior, right? I mean, I would say there's a lot of work to be done with carbon credits in general. Yeah. But so would you say overall that we need to work more on the incentives for the industry? Well, I think, so you have different methodologies right now. Um, so for one thing, carbon credits, that you have a quality and vintage issue with them, right? So carbon credits aren't the best model because uh, there's a lot of bad carbon credits out there that really aren't yeah. doing any good. RECs are different because a REC typically is renewable energy was generated. If you, you have to consume that REC within a year, mm -hmm. there are guidelines, it's, Correct. It's, it's very structured. But when it comes to Bitcoin, so you know, there's been a lot of arguments. Do you look at the carbon or the energy cost to generate a Bitcoin? Well, the problem is there are only 2 million Bitcoin left to be mined. What about all the old Bitcoin? That would mean one Bitcoin has a lower footprint than, an old Bitcoin would have a lower footprint than a new Bitcoin, possibly. Mm -hmm. You have the, OK, look at the energy cost per transaction. What does it cost to run the Bitcoin network and divide it by the number of transactions? That doesn't really do a good deal of explanation because if you're holding your Bitcoin, you're actually uh, consuming uh, carbon, if you think about it. So Professor Troy Cross came up with this concept of the maintenance cost of Bitcoin, which I think is very viable, where you essentially say that if you look at the Bitcoin that you hold, what percentage of all the Bitcoin out there is that? And what percentage does that represent of the energy consumed annually to maintain the Bitcoin blockchain? And then you offset that by buying essentially hash rate futures on only green energy produced Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, you're actually incentivizing Bitcoin miners who only use renewable energy because they're the only ones who can sell you those hash rate futures. Mm -hmm. So we have three minutes and 20 seconds left. So I want to ask each and every one of you, what do you think we're doing, the, the industry is doing wrong? Like, what, what do you think? needs to be done for, for, yeah, what keeps you up at night, let's say, um, on this topic? Fred, you seem ready to go. Uh, what keeps me up at night? I think there are lots of things that keep us up at night. Price of Bitcoin, <laughs> global hash rate growth, price of miners, capital markets, etc. But um, what I think the key thing today is, and I've been speaking about this for about a year, the energy companies are coming into this industry. The energy companies are going to start investing in, they already are, investing in data center projects that are housing Bitcoin, AI processing, machine learning processors, all these types of compute load which are interruptible. They view it as a perfectly sane way for them to underwrite more energy capacity. So the renewable energy guys are going to build out uh, large data center projects. They're investing in them. They want Bitcoin miners as customers. Um, and uh, you know, we think there's a lot that can be done to accelerate that. Mm -hmm. And it's the regulatory issue. I think if we got clarity on the regulation regarding crypto um, at the federal level and through this White House executive order, whether it's the Lummis, Gillibrand bill, whatever it may be, we just need regulatory clarity. And then very conservative industries like the energy industry would be willing to double down and invest. Okay. Harry, you have less time now because Fred's... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, what keeps me up at night is that I'm not doing enough for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a fundamental human transformation technology. It's going to bring prosperity broadly to populations that have not had access to this type of prosperity before. And so what keeps me up at night is that I'm not doing enough. Mm -hmm. If only you had a time turner. I think it's education and, and information. I think we were talking also, right? Like there's so much misinformation. Um, maybe we've been cast in a bad light and just like the public runs with it. When they're when in, in reality, like what Harry was saying earlier, right, there's many more industries that do have much more responsibility that they need to take when it comes to energy consumption and the perpetuation of these types of energy uses. But I mean, that's what we have to live with, and it just keep telling people, educating people, clarifying, and then maybe they'll hopefully understand. Right. Example: State of New York, fossil fuel. Only Bitcoin miners are taken as an industry that can't re-energize fossil fuel plants. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why not just anybody? Why specifically pick Bitcoin miners? 
I think that's a great question to end this uh, panel with. Thank you guys for, for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for yeah. attending. Thank you.